Hi everyone, uh, my name's Chris. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, the research that I did as part of my PhD. Um, I investigated the way in which nerve cells communicate in the spinal cord and how that's altered um, following peripheral nerve injury. My research focused on the spinal thalamic processing of pain sensing nerves and the point at which they enter the spinal cord in this lower portion here. Um, First order neurons that carry pain signals from the periphery enter the spinal cord and then synapse prior to then sending that information to higher brain regions. And it was this network that I was particularly interested in. Besides the regular chemical synaptic activity that's occurring here, I was interested in how direct cellular communication can um, and is involved in pain processing via channels um, called gap junctions. Previous work has been done, um, or had been done, systemically um, that was shown to be by systemically applying compounds that disrupt these gap junctions. Uh, it turns out that they can reduce neuronal cell death and allodynia following peripheral nerve damage. Gap junctions are intercellular channels that permit small molecules to shuffle between, from one cell to another and thus directly link the interior of adjacent cells. They're comprised of connexin proteins, each of which has four transmembrane domains. Six of these form one connexon, which is one half of a gap junction. Two of these connexons line up in neighbouring cells to form one single channel um, between the two in a gap junction. They have a role in motor rhythms in the ventral horn linked with motor control in the spinal cord, but very little work had been done on the dorsal horn linked to pain processing in the spinal cord. But what we did know um, was that they are present in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, the rear portion which is involved in pain processing, and that they existed in both glial and neuronal cells. The hypothesis of this entire project then was that gap junction connectivity between nerve cells and glial cells um, contribute to interneural communication in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and that this is disrupted by chronic pain conditions, and in the long term, these alterations can alter sensory perception. One of the ways in which I studied this was to take transverse spinal cord slices removed in a surgical procedure from Wistar rats and placed them into an interface chamber which kept the cell tissue um, and cells alive and then we were able to flush over artificial cerebrospinal fluid to keep the tissue alive and record electrical activity from the substantia gelatinosa which is the area of the spinal cord that those pain sensing nerves first enter and uh, connect with other nerves before sending that information to the higher brain regions. The compound that I used to actually generate the neuronal activity in the cells um, is 4-aminopyridine, 4-AP. This is a potassium channel blocker that elicits electrical activity in the healthy cells that have been extracted from the Wistar rats. So here's um, two example traces, one at the top in control spinal fluid and one at the bottom after 45 minutes of perfusion of 4 amino purity. So the actual activity that I was interested in that's linked to the gap junction connectivity actually occurs in between the large population spiking activity. This marries up with the work that was done in cortical neurons where gap junction connectivity has been far more extensively studied. The way that I quantified this activity that occurs as a sub-threshold in between the large population spikes was via um, um, uh, quantifying the power amplitude and the power area of this signal. So if you look, the dotted line in control um, spinal fluid is very low, and then in 4AP um, we see a, the generation of this rhythmic activity. <coughs> This is quantified here, so we see the development of this activity um, from ACSF in the presence of 4 amino pyridine. We see a large uh, generation of, of amplitude and, and area of the signal. 
So once we've generated some neuronal activity in these slices where we've managed to maintain the, the health of the cells, we were able to then pharmacologically target specific proteins and genes involved in gap junction communication. I did this using a number of compounds, but two that I'm going to speak about today is GAP26 and trimethylamine. GAP26 is a mimetic peptide that specifically targets a glial connecting protein that's involved in gap junctions. So the hypothesis wasn't that this would completely disrupt the, uh, the network activity, but to identify whether or not it was in part reliant upon gap junction connectivity, as well as your traditional synaptic transmission. So this is what we saw um, with GAP26. We saw a significant reduction in power amplitude and the power area of the signal when we co-applied that GAP junction uncoupler with the neuronal network activity generator 4AP. On the flip side of that, I also looked to see if whether or not we could actually enhance the activity by opening and encouraging more transmission through um, GAP junction connectivity. This is what TMA trimethylamine does. We can see here from 4AP, um, in, uh, uh, 4AP alone compared to TMA and 4AP, we actually saw a significant increase in the neuronal network activity. So the takeaway observation from this is that by using pharmacological tools that target gap junctions, we can both enhance and disrupt network-based neuronal activity in the portions of the spinal cord that we know are involved in processing pain input. Many of the pharmacological tools that we used targeted very specific connection proteins, which are the building blocks of the gap junction channels. I had a transgenic mouse line that expressed green fluorescent protein instead of connection 36, which is a neuronal specific gap junction. I did some immunohistochemistry to establish actually where that expression lied because we knew that there was some exp expression in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord but I was really interested to know whether or not they're actually expressed in the region that I'm taking the electrophysiological recordings from. Turns out that that was the case. This is a, a heat map of transverse spinal slice and you can see clearly towards the back there in lamina 1 and lamina 2 which is the part of the spinal cord slice that I'm taking the recordings from, we see a high intensity of this neuronal specific connection being expressed. I also looked at the, develop, the embryonic development of gap junctions in uh, cultured cells from uh, Wistar rats. This time I used gabazine to generate activity within the, the cells. They were dissociated and left to grow and then form neural connections um, amongst themselves. I'll show you a video of some healthy connected cells. So we see nice rhythmic bursts that three weeks prior to this um, would have been oscillating all over the place and, and weren't synchronous and, and networked. So I applied a similar technique to see whether or not this network that was developed from embryonic spinal cord, uh, spinal cord cells was in any way part reliant upon this gap junction connectivity. So the paradigm um, applies gabazine to generate the activity for the first five minutes and then a combination cocktail of drugs was applied after that five minute period. So, uh, three examples here. Carbonoxalone, which is a non-specific gap junction uncoupler, so no matter what connection um, it is, uh, is involved in the gap junctions, it will be pulled apart. We saw quite a prominent um, effect with carbonoxalone, but still didn't completely reduce the activity. Trimethylamine, um, again, that is the one that um, enhances gap junction connectivity. We saw an increase there. And quinine, which specifically targets connection 36, the neuronal gap junction, um, altered it slightly but didn't completely remove it. So all this work has been cellular and, and not on an organism level, um, so that was the next step, was to take this into a behavioural study. 
we use the transgenic mice that express the green fluorescent protein instead of that neuronal connexin in this study. The Hargreaves method of thermal sensitivity um, was used to establish baseline sensitivity levels of, of thermal stimulation to the hind paws of mice that were deficient in this, in this um, gene and those that weren't. So the practicality of it is that a thermal stimulus from a high intensity lap bulb is shone on the, under, on the underside, the plantar surface um, of the mice and the pore withdrawal latency in seconds is measured. So the time at which it takes to reach the pain threshold and um, the pore is removed. Averages were taken of at least three readings from each. Each mouse then underwent a partial sciatic nerve ligation, which is a surgical procedure that I carried out to partly ligate the sciatic nerve. This being the spinal cord, the spinal nerves, uh, the lumbar nerves um, converging into the sciatic nerve, and then part a third to half of this was ligated with suture thread, which left some nerves completely intact and not damaged, and others that were constricted. This was then, uh, the, the thermal latency was then tested in the mice that were deficient and the mice that were um, regular every week for six weeks after that. So the first observation was to see whether or not a mouse that is deficient in that connexin has any alteration in its pain perception um, prior to any surgery. The finding was that there was no significant difference in the thermal sensitivity of these mice just by having um, a knockout of that particular gene. So we know that connexin 36 is involved all over the place. It's, it's, it's involved in the retina, it's involved in the heart. Um, so this isn't just a specific, a pain specific um, process. However, following the nerve ligation, we can see here in the wild type mice, so this is the amount of time it took to withdraw its paw prior to the injury, and then this is the amount of time it took seven days after. So you can see that the mice are withdrawing their paws much quicker, which represents the thermal hyperalgesia that's been generated from the, from the nerve injury. This, slowly in time, worms its way back up towards baseline levels. The mice that are deficient in connection 36 the protein involved in gap junction connectivity, which is hypothesized to be not necessarily upregulated in quantity, but altered in its sensitivity in, in, as a response to a peripheral nerve injury. Uh, they react um, to, to less of a degree. So the amount of time that it takes the connection 36 deficient mice to remove their paw is quicker than baseline, but it's not as quick as those that, that don't have that um, uh, involved. So the, the idea, uh, the, the hypothesis um, behind the CX36 um, potentially being upregulated and causing this increased sensitivity and hyperalgesia um, is backed up in part by this research in that it continues back up towards baseline um, but does not have as much, uh, the, the Meister are deficient in connection 36 and as sensitive to the nerve injury following surgery. The takeaway observations from that are that the mice deficient in connection 36 express less of a change in their paw withdrawal latency to thermal stimulation following a partial sciatic nerve ligation. The differences in changes of withdrawal latency between the reporter mice and the wild type mice indicate an involvement of connection 36 in facilitating thermal hyperalgesia during a neuropathic pain state. In summary, the in vivo behavioral data showed that a deficiency in connection 36 could alter the sensory perception during a neuropathic pain following nerve injury and reduce thermal hyperalgesia. The embryonic spinal cord, spinal cord culture work showed that the rhythmic network activity seen there is reliable in part on gap junction intercellular communication. The molecular and histology work confirms the expression of those glial and neuronal connection subtypes in the spinal cord and their relevance loca relevant location based on pain sensing afferent inputs. And the electrophysiology 
indicated that by targeting these gap junctions, we can both enhance and disrupt parameters of network activity in the area of the spinal cord that's linked to nociception. All of these factors um, confound, uh, confounded support the hypothesis that gap junctions do contribute to interneuronal communication in that portion of the spinal cord and that this is disrupted in pain conditions and that in the long term these alterations uh, these alterations can alter sensory perception. So I like all other researchers in this area uh, feel that non-chemical neurotransmission should be um, overshadowing the direct electrical stimulation um, di uh, direct between the nerve cells when developing analgesics for pain sufferers. Um, this is an area that hasn't received a huge amount um, or hadn't received a huge amount of research at the time um, but it's been pleasing to see that that has continued um, since finishing this in 2012. So hopefully research into gap junction connectivity can help provide information to work towards a useful tool um, in, an, in an analgesic um, procedure for helping pain sufferers. Uh, I of course need to thank the pharmaceutical sponsor Eli Lilly and the Research Council uh, for funding the project. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Are there any questions for Chris? Go on, Mark. Mark. Really, <coughs> really interesting talk, Chris. Fantastic yes. work. Uh, I'm interested in it on a number of levels, so I'll, I'll try and restrict the number of questions. First one is, how specific are these gap junction changes to the nociceptive system as opposed to you know, the, the temperature systems or the touch systems? It's about specificity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's not something that we're able to directly assess in the methods that I've used. Um, by, by taking a more direct approach to I'm just thinking of which one would be most um, relevant, probably the cultured neuron um, prep, because you would potentially, knowing what we know about the physiology of thermal sensitivity, uh, thermal sensitive nerves, pain sensitive nerves and so on, we'd be able to potentially look at parameters that define them as a thermal uh, sensitive nerve or, or a pain sensitive nerve, and then somehow isolate them and grow a thermal specific culture, a pain specific culture, sensory uh, touch specific culture, then carry out something similar and take a look at whether or not the gap junction connectivity is as equally involved in, in each of those, yeah. possibly. Yeah. And on the, the CX36, is there a human equivalent? Because you are using it in mice, because I mean then it's looking at a genetic underpinning for pain sensitivity. I'm not entirely sure what the basis of developing that line was. It was something that we were able to um, gain access to during during the project, but I don't believe that it was developed because of a specific phenotype that's represented in humans. Mm -hmm. The usefulness of it for me um, was it provided a very, very specific um, knockout um, of a neuronal specific um, connection gene, because there are just short of 50 different connections, many of which are expressed in a number of different cell types, some of which are expressed in, in glial cells, astrocytes, neurons, some in between e each other. Connection 43 and connection 36 were some of the most sort of, reliably sourced um, connections with regards to the acceptance that yes, they are neuronal specific, they are glial specific. One study of um, a thousand different studies, in none of those studies did anybody find a connection, uh, connection 43 being expressed anywhere else other than glial cells. Likewise, it's very widely accepted that connection 36 is neuronal specific. So it also supports the idea that the supporting cells within the spinal cord are hugely important in that aberrant, pro pro aberrant processing of pain perception following a nerve injury. It's not just about the nerve cells, it's about the glial cells, the astrocytes and all the supporting cells. And I didn't go into too much detail about which was which and all the other ones that I did, 
But we didn't just focus on neuronal cells, we looked at the supporting cells as well um, and their importance in, in that pain process. Just one last question, Chris. What are you doing at the moment? Because you now work at Leeds Beckett, don't you? I do, yeah. I've gone, I've gone full circle. So I did my degree here with uh, with Mark and and Asama and Gazala. Did my degree here, then moved up the road to Leeds University and did my PhD. Then I did a, a post doctorate in uh, Manchester, and I've now come full circle back to Leeds Beckett. Um, all of this work was cellular. At the very most I got to work with mice, I didn't get to do any work with people and patients. So uh, my my work that ran in parallel with all this as an outdoor adventure sports instructor has allowed me to then merge the two lives together. So I now work with wounded military personnel um, and I'm bringing in a neurological aspect to that research. Um, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. So I have a full-time research fellow position at the university, but I'm based up in Headingley. So the first thing I did when I got the position was got in touch with these guys <laughs> and, uh, and and told them what, what I was up to. So Kate, unfortunately, has run out of the door, but I'm really keen to speak to her about educating the staff that work with the um, current serving military personnel to do all these adventure sports and make sure that we're addressing pain management um, correctly. That's very good, but I advise you uh, not to speak to Kate about involving this lecture in their pain education program, because otherwise all the nurses and the medic will really resign. Why would they do that? Because it's at the cellular level, very complicated, very detailed, and I'm sure the medic will not like this. I have my own experience, because I taught in a medical school in Libya for about... Uh, like five years, and then I met some of the students I was teaching like 10 years later, and one of them told me, oh, Dr. Osama, it's very nice to see you. Can I tell you that the stuff you taught us was useless, and we haven't used any of the gap junction physiology you taught us at all in our uh, like uh, uh, profession as doctors? It's probably the way you started. <laughs> <laughs> it was in everybody's mind. It was all about to get it over. <laughs> well, uh, you got you, so don't get me wrong, I don't intend on teaching them all about the physiology of gap junctions. Um, but we definitely need to make sure that the, the chronic pain sufferers that are coming to, to the centre um, are, are being looked after in the correct way to facilitate their involvement in these activities as well as teaching them about the plasticity of the mind its capability um, and, and also the plasticity um, in relation to their recovery and um, to make sure that we can get them involved in these things and have the impact that we want and we're not having to, um, we, we want to include as many people as we can do in the activities which is very, very high. It's very nice to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Cheers, you very thank you very much. much. Thank you. Right, we have one more speaker before our break, so if I can just do the bye, Nikki.